Hello and welcome to The Hat of Many Things, with me, Tom. The astute among you will have realised I'm not Mike, my co-host, who normally does the introductions. That's because this is part two of an episode that we released a few weeks ago with Satiros Brucato. So I won't keep you any longer, and I'll let you get back to where we were last time, which was discussing communities in RPGs. Um, but it leads us really well into the next point, which is communities and gaming communities, and the fact that they are real communities built up of people. Um, and we can get very involved in our characters and very attached to other people's characters, but there is a differentiation between characters and people. Um, for example, if two people argue in character, it can be very easy for them to think that the other person's annoyed at them out of character. And sometimes you really have to say, look, the characters had an argument, not the players. The players need to calm down a little bit. Um, and But there are communities. Uh, Fanboy 3 in Manchester is one of the best um, board game and roleplay gaming shops that I've ever been in. And he, he built his, Dave built his entire shop on the basis that everything you can buy in his shop, you can buy cheaper online. So he has to make you want to spend money there. So he gets people playing in the shop. He encourages people. GMs get a discount in the shop. They get every session they GM in the shop. That's every smart. session they GM in the shop. They get shop credit um, because the players all play a little bit, pay a little bit for the table, and it goes towards the GM's credit in the shop. So he brings in customers who spend time there. Uh, he runs tournaments of board games, etc. And and by building the community around the hobby, people will choose to pay the five pound extra for the copy of something they're buying instead of buying it online because they want to support the community that's made them feel like they have somewhere to go. That's, that's very, very smart. My, my, my compliments to that, that my, my compliments to the, to the shop owner there. That's, that's very, very smart. I wish more people were doing that. I was going to say, I think it's probably one of those ways they have, what well, they have to do now to survive, because a lot of places, <clears throat> I mean, if you, if you can just buy on Amazon for less, why wouldn't you is the argument a lot of people use and being able to go back and have a rapport with the guy. I mean, if, I would always happily pay a bit more to support my local shop, but the local shop has to feel like a local shop. It can't just be just another faceless shop. Right. Or or worse yet, gatekeeping, you know, where it's, oh, you know, oh, somebody with breasts came in. Let's all ogle her. What the fuck, man? It's a business. Yeah. <laughs> it's a business. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> I, I, I really never understood that one. <laughs> What I'll try and find as well is a, is a conversation Dave had online in addition, in response to a prominent YouTuber about the usefulness of your local uh, gaming store. Here it is, um, which it would be worth a read once we're done recording. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a, a good an interesting conversation where he discusses the role that local gaming stores have in the community and in, in business and how companies trying to bypass them and go straight to, um, straight to the, the customer can restrict their customer base and stop the hobby from growing. There, there's a very compelling, and I, I say, <clears throat> I say this as a publisher and and as somebody who's working with a with uh, with another publisher that has been largely uh, avoiding um, retail sales. There's a there there's a there's a real economic reason, and I don't just mean in terms of the income uh, for doing it. Unfortunately, the hobby trade distribution is broken, has been broken, um, and for the longest time. Uh, for the long, for the longest time, a company had to sell thousands and thousands and thousands of units. Uh, even even at White Wolf, when we were the first or second, depending on how you rated, most successful gaming company in the business, we still needed to sell a constant stream of of new product because distribution uh, took such a large chunk out of. Uh, uh, such, Distribution took such a large chunk of the retail price, 60% in most cases, that by the time you met your production expenses of putting the book together and you had met your printing expenses involved with printing you know, X thousand number of copies and then your shipping expenses from your warehouse, which is also incredibly expensive to obtain, you had to sell you know, a book from White Wolf was considered a failure if it sold less than 5,000 copies. That's not because White Wolf was rolling in money. That's because that's how much it cost to maintain the infrastructure. Uh, the, the infrastructure of a warehouse is phenomenally expensive, especially in the States where you get taxed uh, on your, your inventory at least once a year, maybe more depending on the state that you're in. And a large part of Dave's argument was that when you've got a local gaming store with your product in, that's where you're going to find your new customers. Your existing yes. customers will keep coming back to purchase new products. But unless people are casually browsing who aren't already engaged with the hobby, you're not going to grow mm-hmm. that customer base. Right. Well, it's I, I can't speak for uh, um, 
I can't speak for other companies, but I know that with with uh, Onyx Path Publishing, we have a retailer program. You know, if a, if an individual retailer wants to, you know, wants to order from direct from Onyx Path, they can do that. And there are a number of, of uh, retailers who do. But we're not going through third party distribution because third party distribution wants sixty percent of the bloody. And you you're paying a lot of money with third party distribution for what is effectively a middleman to facilitate your product. They're not doing much of anything for that money they're just they're just connecting to people who maybe not connected previously yeah it's a large markup and unfortunately it's also their gatekeepers themselves i i admit and i i've i've been pretty pretty public about this one i admit i have a grudge against uh, um, uh against the retail distribution to a point because uh when Laughing Pan Productions and I put out uh, Deliria Fairy Tales from the Millennium, the online market hadn't didn't exist yet, so we had to go through conventional distribution. What we got when we we sold over three hundred copies when, the weekend that it premiered at DragonCon, and we figured, you know, I had a six year history with White Wolf. I had a bunch of I had RPGA awards, I had Gamma awards, Emmy awards, beautiful book comes out from the guy who created mage and every distributor except one turned us down flat they didn't even want to look at it one of them looked at it and said this is his exact words it's pretty but it doesn't have enough big tits and big guns to to uh to entice the 14 year old boy and that is assuming that the core demographic for all play gaming is a 14 year old boys which in my experience it's not right it's, exactly it's university students so that's a misunderstanding of the target market Exactly. And when, when we would, so what we did, what we ended up having to do was we ended up having to go to every convention we could afford. And we hit, we hit like 17 conventions in one year in, in 2004. And the good part of that is, is we sold, we sold many copies and sometimes sold out every time we did that. The bad part of it is, is every, almost every cent we made went into attending the next convention. So at the end of the at the end of that year, when Alliance looked at us and said, again, exact words, we just wanted to see if you'd last long enough to be worth our attention. Well, at that point, it's it's well off you trot. We don't want to work with you. Yeah, we don't want to work yeah. with, with people like that. You know, that it's unsavory business practices. Yeah, we we did end up doing uh you know we did end up working with those distributors once they finally deigned to admit our existence. But by that point, our finances were exhausted. Our people were exhausted. My attitude, I would I would really like to get power cords into retail distribution. And I'm uh, I'm I'm in discussions right now with a few other co- with a few companies to uh, to distribute through them. But my attitude uh, after dealing with the distributors both at White Wolf and at uh, uh, with with Laughing Pan was fuck you guys. You deserve to go out of business. <laughs> yeah, it's and I can't say I disagree. I mean, I know that I've had conversations with store owners about certain board game companies who would maybe release a product, um, even via Kickstarter. And this is more in the board game perspective. Um, they would then any they would then produce stock for the shops to sell for people who didn't back the Kickstarter, and then they would immediately after shifting all of that stock to shops announce a second edition Kickstarter, uh, which would leave the shops in the state of great. Now I have a bunch of first edition products people don't want to buy because you're releasing a second edition product. I feel like you've shipped your excess onto me, and now I can't sell it because of your intentional business decision. And and those shop owners will not deal with companies who have done that anymore. I understand that that that's really that's that's really bad that's really bad business practices. It, it counterproductive. I mean, to to go back to take out the good bad, it's counterproductive. It is it is it, it does not make business sense to alienate your customer base. It doesn't matter whether that's um, whether whether you're talking about a, a publisher alienating retailers, or whether you're talking about you know a publisher alienating fans. To a point, <laughs> I say to a point because. There are a lot of the you know, anti-diversity, anti-progress people going, you're alienating your customer base. No asshole, we're growing it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're expanding it beyond what it currently is. And if we lose if we lose 10% of our current business um, base, but expand the overall business base by 100%, it's a net win. Yeah. And I, I, I really, I have, I have no... I have no patience for people who think that the, the who think that gaming or fantasy belongs only to them. Absolutely. No, it's, it's for everybody. Sorry, following on from you discussing in the in, kind of the industry publishing issues, uh, the bad actors who we've discussed on Kickstarter aside, how did you feel about using Kickstarter to sell stuff? I mean, I, I know you mentioned it positively earlier, 
Uh, has that been a big change? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, we couldn't have done Mage 20 or Power Chords without Kickstarter. My, my father could not understand when I was trying to order Mage 20 through Kickstarter. He was like, wait, so you're paying for a product that doesn't exist yet? I was like, yes, because I want the product to exist. And he's like, but mm-hmm. it's it because my dad's still in that old sort of he he's a business owner. He's like, but it's mm-hmm. the business needs to produce the product to then sell it. That's how bi- that's the business model. He couldn't understand the business model of investing in something prior to its creation, if that makes sense. Yeah, but that's what an event, that's what a stockholder yeah, does. But he couldn't he couldn't understand it from a consumer point of view because a consumer's in a different position to a stockholder. Because as a as someone investing in M twenty, I was investing in a product that I may or may not receive, but I wasn't getting any shares or any investment return on it other than a consumer product he really struggled to process the the sort of concept in his head really it's it's still it's still the same thing though i mean if if someone if someone invests in a tech company and the tech company goes under they're not getting anything either you know and there you see this all the time you especially saw it in in it in the 90s and early 2000s where there were people who would throw you know thousands or millions of dollars at a tech company that would then spend it all on having a luxurious office and then go out of business without actually producing anything. In the case of backing someone like Onyx Path, you were trusting, that is, you were putting, you were being a shareholder in a experienced team of people who would produce something that would be worthwhile. I was just going to say at that point, I mean, that was definitely, I think Mage 20 must have been one of my first few Kickstarters I supported. I didn't go for the full book because I'd not played the game. I, f- I feel like the first few Kickstarters I did were all for existing companies. So I backed Ogre by Steve Jackson Games. I backed Mage 20 and various things like that. It was only later once I started to trust trust Kickstarter as a system. Mm-hmm. You, know, you still have to make a decision based on what the person is trying to say. Mate, I was stupid enough to back Kingdom Death. There's a lot of money. Oh, ow. I, I enjoy the game. It's a fantastic game. I enjoy receiving every bit of the product. It, you know, I, the quality of the miniatures is insane, but that was a lot of money to, to put on something. I was the first person I know to use Kickstarter from a publisher's standpoint, and I learned an awful lot of things not to do. <laughs> uh, Power Chords was was produced in the first, I think, six months or so that, that Kickstarter existed <clears throat> because uh, my friend and collaborator, Aaron Ace Vado, uh, from um, uh, Pinnacle uh, and Savage Worlds, uh, he and I had worked together on a few things already, and uh, he, he said, "Hey, there's this thing, this Kickstarter thing. Want to do something with it?" I just I've not played Savage World, but I have heard very good things about it. It's a very it, it's when we were talking earlier about uh, intuitive and dramatic and so forth. It's uh, Savage World is is very uh, I, I would put that in the intuitive, dramatic end of the uh, of of the that that spectrum or that you know that in that Venn in that Venn diagram it would be uh um it would be there's there's definite calculative and strategic aspects to it but as a system it's very simple it's very easy to use and uh it's it's designed around being um uh, being quick and easy to pick up and and dramatic in its applications so it is a good system i recommend it so kickstarter is a plan do you feel like you've managed to create products you otherwise would not have been able to take financial risk on producing because some of that oh risk... absolutely do you think though that by obviously consumers are willing to take that risk that's the part of kickstarter mm-hmm. that is is maybe not as consumer friendly as the consumer exposes themselves to more risk um but by doing so they enable the artist or the producer or the manufacturer to take a lighter risk in what they're doing and you think that's that's one of the greatest merits of it well and and something that it's been doing that that i both as a designer and a uh, and a fan of the medium really love is that it is also facilitating online sales and crowdfunding are facilitating a an, a previously unprecedented revolution in creativity in role-playing games uh, back in the old days when you had the uh the, the, the retail distribution taking 60 or 70, sometimes even more if you have a, a, a small independent game company uh, of, of the, uh, the cover and you had to sell X thousand copies before you could even break even, you weren't able to take many creative risks. I mean, there, there were few, but the majority of the creative risks that were taken in role-playing games prior to 2000 were taken by companies like White Wolf that were already established and could afford them. Yeah, or, or perhaps Wizards, who I, I wouldn't say yeah. have taken a great a deal wizard, of risk. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, God, wizard, yes, wizards wizards play things quite safe, I think. Yeah. Well, they, they did do Everway, which which was a risk. It was also a bad game, which was unfortunate. <laughs> but uh, they did invest a, a tremendous amount of money in that, and it didn't pan out. But 
But thanks to <clears throat> thanks to crowdfunding and direct distribution, you've got things like now like Monster Hearts and Bluebeard's Bride, um, Li- My Life with Master, which granted My Life with Master has been out for a little while, but Colonial Gothic, uh, Dance of the Damned, Passages, um, Apocalypse World, uh, and you're by way of role playing, you're now able. The creators are able to explore subjects and approaches that, that would have been commercially impossible even ten years ago. Hell, even five years ago in some cases, uh, and certainly wouldn't have been possible in, in the '90s or '80s or '70s. And I'm loving that because someone like Avery Adler <coughs> or Whitney St- Whitney Strix Beltran. I may have mispronounced it. If, if I mispronounced your name, sorry. I'm sorry, Whitney. Um, you you can do things both as a creator and a gamer that were impossible. Or well, okay, I'll back up. As a designer, you can design games that would have been previously impossible. Take creative risks that would have been previously impossible. Yeah, you could you could have made or designed them, but you wouldn't have been able to find a distributor for them. Exactly, you wouldn't have had a dist- you wouldn't have had a distributor. You might have sold. You know, you can sell. 100 copies and break even of something if you produce it yourself i mean with with power cords i went for high-end production value so i was massively out of pocket on i'm still massively out of pocket on that. I, I hope <laughs> it's selling okay i'd like it to sell a lot better just because i, I invested that eight thousand dollars of my own money I didn't get paid for doing it but that's another power cord that's, that's power example. cords everybody go check it out <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> the game of rock and roll role play uh, but that that's, cool. that's slightly different to the old Kiss system, right? Oh, I God, believe yes. Kiss had a role playing game of some sort. <laughs> really? Wow! I'm glad I never heard of that. But yeah, and and so going back to what I was saying with uh, with 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 Ace, uh, Ace suggested that we do something, and so I came up with power chords because I've been a musician on and off since the '80s. I, I've been a roadie, a uh, DJ, and uh, a music seller, and I absolutely I, I, I play in a band now called Telesterion. Uh, and so I love music. I love the people who make it. And one of the things that I, as a reader and I, as a gamer got frustrated with, or get frustrated with is when somebody has got a character who's, I don't know, a rock guitarist or something like that. And it's very obvious that the author has no idea what it's actually like in a band. And so I came up with this idea of a role-playing game that was actually based on real musical culture with fairies or vampires or whatever, if you want to add those things. But that first and foremost, it's a game about music and the people who make it, and that I love it. It's it it is is definitely a labor of love on my end, and it wouldn't have been possible to create it at all uh, without uh, without Kickstarter. As it was, it took a lot longer than it should have, uh, in part because uh, there were some uh, life explosions on the part of uh, some of the people involved with it. And so we learned a number of things. One of the things we learned was always have your book written before you kickstart the damn thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah otherwise you get mage mage delays don't you yeah mage, mage 20 we hadn't edited it yet but the uh but the, the half million word monstrosity was written by the time that we which is already the risk you're taking on in that you've spent the time developing that product and have to hope that people will want it enough to kickstart it and sell it as opposed exactly. to pitching the product and then writing it based on what you've what donations you received yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, as speaking as somebody who's done both, I would I would advise anybody who is thinking of using Kickstarter, make your product first. You don't have to finish it, or at least start the, the product first. Yes, <clears throat> never never wait to start work until after you know whether or not it's funded, because things will go wrong. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think Drive to RPG also has a role to play in that? Oh yeah, Kickstarter is really good for creating projects. But mm-hmm. you can't generate sustained sales through Kickstarter. Whereas right. I think I, I think I purchased the majority of my Rob Bay rulebooks through RPG Drive Through RPG now. And that's mm-hmm. a print on demand, isn't it? So you don't necessarily yes. have manufacturing costs or stock that you then have to shift. I would imagine they charge a large margin for that, but it creates a level of safety for you that you, you don't have excess stock. They they don't actually charge a large margin. It's that's that's incredible. That's really good. It's twenty percent if you're working with other people, you know, if you're like if it's available sale, so on Amazon and so forth. And the price will of course be determined by the size of the book and or even the quality of the paper, because you can choose higher or lower quality paper through them. Yeah. What the the way that <clears throat> drive throughs price structure is the cost of printing, 
and you determine what margin you want to pay them, or the, rather their, their margin, uh, drive throughs margin is it's 20% or 30%. You decide whether you want the 20% or the 30%. Um, and then everything above that, you set the, the, you set the cover price, the, the retail price, and everything above print cost plus their margin is yours. So what is the motivation to pay them 30 instead of 20? Other than simply goodwill, they handle the printing and the and the shipping. Yeah, but I mean, if they can do that for twenty, other than goodwill, what's the motivation to give them thirty? Uh, exclusive uh, exclusivity or uh, or the ability to print through publish through multiple uh, venues. <clears throat> you get a better you get a better break if you go with them if you go only with them. But like we choose to go through. Um, both Amazon and uh, well, Am- we we're distributing through Amazon through ourselves as, as we sell uh, we sell copies also um, and like I said I want to set up retail distribution in some way uh, but I also distribute uh, we also distribute through uh, through drive through RPG and that's where the majority of our, our sales are like I said I think I buy almost all of my rule books through our drive through RPG if they are not a current Kickstarter yeah. And drive through RPG with because, thanks to the print on demand technology, the back catalogs and old editions and all sorts. Right, exactly. You're not having to did, pay. You know, did you like first or second ed more than revised ed? Go buy first and second ed. It's available. Exactly. Yep. And that that I think has that's been huge for the uh, for the hobby as well. Um, and I, I think that's been it's it's been great for the people who you know maybe were you know five years old when when Vampire Revised came out, but they can get a copy of Vampire Revised and it's brand new. It's not you know twenty years old and falling apart. You know, I, I was introduced to World of Darkness through Revised, which shows you how long World of Darkness has been going going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, counting the gray hairs in his beard. <laughs> I was going to say with drive through. Just, just a brief point. Um, we have some friends who uh, they did a successful Kickstarter or two, and then oh, they've moved yes. to doing drive through. And that's this is Artemis Games. There will be a link in yes. the show notes. Uh, they do uh, some fantastic really little products called. Uh, so they're the cards, aren't they, Tom? I can't remember what they call character cards and plot cards. So they've got a deck of NPCs you can draw for your D and D game if you're not very good at coming up with something on the spot. Yeah, it's it's a really it's a really cool concept. It's um, when we first heard about it, it's it's like a it started off as an as just a standard fifty two deck of cards, and so you can use it as a full deck of cards, and then it has like character names, brief backgrounds, and then even more information. And if you just want to play fifty, if you just want to play cards, you can. It's still a normal deck of cards. And then then I think the first Kickstarter did really well, and they ended up also adding like a set of tarot cards to the deck. And so there's the character nice. cards. There's location cards. They've then they've done urban versions. They're about to launch a sci-fi set, but in that they kind of got some initial success on Kickstarter with that. And I think they do kickstart each of the set of cards. But then they've got their own website, and they now have um, a Patreon where you can support them on a monthly basis. And they are writing systemless um, stories that you can use as a DM that are provided as PDFs via drive-through. So that allows them the whole the drive-through system allows them to obviously continue to get money if people buy stuff after the fact and they can just say there's our entire back catalogue but for those of you who have backed them on patreon you get a link to the pdf for free so it's a very mm-hmm. it's, it's like a very simple distribution system they don't have to worry about hosting on their own website all of that and yeah yeah i mean it's encouraged me to buy more games so that's obviously a good thing there are so many systems out there which is the next topic i mean we we've covered it to an extent already and you've got crunch versus fluff uh we'll get on to quote unquote fluff later and and the problems with it but Hey. Crunch versus fluff. Ars Magica. I, I love I love that I can make any kind of spell and that there's loads of numbers and things I can do, but I can do the same thing with mage without any of the maths. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is... There, and neither of them are, I think, superior. Some, people's, some people really like the number crunching part of games. I, one of my friends is very much into what he refers to as a simulationist game, um, where everything has different stats and rules. And, and some people, like my, my partner, really prefer a, what you would call an intuitive game, where it's just... just it's more about the story and the narrative and what's happening. Um, mm-hmm. where's, where does your preference lie? Uh, my preference is intuitive, dramatic. When I when when I'm running a game or if I'm playing a game, I I personally like to have as few rules and I consult as few rules as possible. Uh, like I was saying earlier in the in the conversation, I tend to just wing it. Um, however, I realize most people can't do that, and so when I'm designing games, I design with the uh i designed with a certain amount of a certain amount of calculative and strategic elements because i recognize that that's what the uh, what what certain people in the audience will want or need 
I mean, I've been gaming for 40 years and I have a background in theater and I'm a professional fiction writer. Not everybody has, has the ability to make shit up off the top of their head like that. And so when, as a designer, I make a point of providing a lot of setting material and rules, usually as options. And anyone who's seen Mage 20 sees that there are, um, there are sections with optional rules, italicized optional rule uh, that you can add, it, add in there if you want extra, if you want extra you know, simulationism, and you don't, but you don't have to use. You had optional rules, but you also had optional canon. And I love the way you emphasize with that with Mage, because some people struggled with Thank it. You. Some people were very much like, but what, what happened? What's the story? What's the thing? And Mage has always been a game about possibility. And yeah. anything anything can happen. So the whole idea of what did happen, you would 100% emphasize as an author, whatever you wanted. This could have... A, you, you usually presented three options. This could have happened, this could have happened, or this could have happened. And it's usually quite clear which one is your preferred option as well, which I made me <laughs> smile. You're like, this could have happened, this could have happened, but, you know, I think that this is good, <laughs> which is fine, because it's your book. Um, and, and I choose those suggestions as what would probably be quote-unquote canon, but you went to great pains in M20 to say that canon is what you choose to include as canon. Thank you. Yeah, well, it was that was really important for uh, for Mage uh, Twenty because when when Rich Thomas, uh, the the head of uh, Onyx Path Publishing, and and my old coworker collaborator at White Wolf, uh, he and I were were laying the groundwork for Mage Twenty, and one of the biggest things that we had to confront was the edition war uh, between Second and Revised. Yeah, and I grew up on Revi- I grew up on Revised, and I very much enjoyed Revised, but you know there, there are elements of both that are, that are good. And I think that the sheer vehemence with which fans of each side would argue that that one was terrible or the other mm-hmm. was quite bizarre. Yeah, like just use the one yeah. you like. Don't don't sit there writing essays on why the one shouldn't be. <laughs> just use whichever one you prefer. Why is that so hard? Uh, I think the level of vehemence had a lot to do with uh, the fact that Mage is a game. Fundamentally, it is about hope. It, what we were talking about empowerment earlier. <clears throat> That's Mage is the game that says you can change your world. What Revised did, and this was not Jess Henning's fault. I want to emphasize this. Jen, uh, Jess wound it up wound up getting hung out to dry over this. It was it was a, a dictate from on high. What Revised did was gut that possibility and say, yeah, you lost. Yeah. So one of my friends, John Ryan, has a theory that the reason a new ward had to be created and the old ward sort of died uh, to an extent and was replaced was that there, there became a scenario where nobody could beat the technocracy. It was just the technocracy just just would win. Like, whatever scenario you presented in your head, the technocracy were going to win. And it, it sort of restricted, mm-hmm. old, like, classic world of darkness to an extent where the technocracy were too powerful. And that's his. that was his view on it, as someone who grew up through the generations. That that makes sense. The The actual reason was just there were too many damn books. <laughs> You know, when also when when Vampire the Masquerade first came out in 1991, 2000 was a long way away. Yes, nobody thought that we were going to be nearly as successful oh, oh, as we good, were. Good that, luck that was... keeping up with the changes in internet and virtual adepts and trying to trying to keep pace with the real world. Yeah, and that's <clears throat> when we were doing this. I was talking with a couple of people on this on the Werewolf Forum a few days ago. We had no idea this was going to be a long term thing. You know, even comic books weren't being assembled into um, <clears throat> into trade paperback editions to be examples. You know, it's uh, like like comic book authors. We were just getting the next book out the door. But by 1999, there were over a hundred. There were over 100 werewolf books. There were close to 200 vampire books. There were about 100 mage books. And anybody trying to get in to, to the game at the beginning was just like, would take one look at the 200 vampire books and said, oh, fuck it. And go play something. I else. think this is where V20, where 20th editions really succeeded, is in you only need one book to play any of these games. There are other books mm-hmm. with additional powers and rules and, and bits of setting, but you only need V20, M20, W20 to play those games. Everything else is additional, but not required. Mm-hmm. So one-stop shopping, which is one thing that really annoys me about, say, some of the uh, Wizards of the Coast material is you need at least three books to play one game. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as a core book because their goal is to sell as many books as possible. So you will get uh, something in one book that references another book, and unless you have the other book, it's useless. Clever sort of business design, but incredibly irritating. 
Yeah, I would say at least. I mean, I, I, I get D has done that for quite a while. Like the the three core books. Other than that, you know, those three core books could be stuck together, but it would be an, a big a big book. I, I love the idea of having one single PDF. Don't get me wrong, but um, I, I think that core three is not necessarily um, not necessarily just a money grab. There was there was also a logic behind it of. Mm-hmm. I think there was some logic in separating the DM section and the player section. Yeah, and and also from a <clears throat> going back to to what you were saying earlier about growing the audience, there's definitely a a a certain discouragement factor that comes with being presented with a 300, 400, 500 page book to play a game. Um, this is one of the reasons why we why we have the quick starts. <clears throat> Is okay if you just want to sit down and play mage. Here's a forty-page, you know, quick start, you know, easy, e- you know, easy, simple approach to the rules and a couple of characters and a setting. Go. Uh, if you want to know every, if you want to know the answer to this question or a detailed treatment of this subject, here's your five hundred-page book. And you don't even have to read the whole five hundred-page book. The way that I organized the book was so that. If you're looking for this, here, read these chapters. If you're looking for this, read these chapters. Yeah, if you want to know how the magic rules work, here, read the first nine pages and leave the rest to the people who want to know all the rest, all the details. And um, that the the ability to to the ability to to hand somebody a hundred or a hundred fifty page book as opposed to a five hundred page book has a lot to do with accessibility to the hobby. I think things like. Um... The idea of a basics guide or a starters guide are very helpful, and a lot of these are games where I, I know that it's something they do with D and D, where they publish um, when they were still pub- hadn't even published the player's handbook and everything. They were releasing these small adventures with basic rules so that people can get into trying the game and at least having an idea mm-hmm. of how it works. And I think that really encourages people to get in. I mean, obviously, if you know someone who's a good DM, they can get you into it in stages. They can get you into any game if they know it. Yeah. Yeah. But not everyone has access to that, and there's some interesting stuff going on. What was that game we did, we discussed last week, last time? Oh, was this the one that um, Aaron was playing? Yeah, it's it's D and D without the DM. It's like a, a yeah. So episode. we we had a guest um, on the last episode, uh, Aaron Medic Chamberlain, who is a shoutcaster for esports for League of Legends and Riot Games. And uh, we asked him, we, we rolled and we we're like, RPGs oh, the next episode. Like, Have you ever played one? He's like, No, but I really would like to. And in fact, tomorrow I'm playing my first session of. Whatever the game was called, um, it Dragon will be further Fire? up. Dragonfire or something. Yeah, it's 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 further up in the chat. We can just scroll up and find it. Um, it's by Wizards. Yeah, and he was saying it was designed to be played with a deck of cards, so the game did not require a dungeon master, because being a dungeon master mm. is extremely daunting for someone that's not played before. So if you've got a group that mm-hmm. wants to start playing it but don't know anyone who's played it before, it's a great starting point. That's a really great idea. Um, well, I look forward to your next Kickstarter incorporating it. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you'll do the same thing but better wink wink um, but, um... <laughs> thank you uh, my my next my next few kickstarters uh once once i Ooh, get around have we, got to, uh... have we got hints and have we, have we got teasers now <laughs> <laughs> well um i want to be doing more uh, well i've already started i've got five power chords books in various states of progress are they, are they just going to be categorized by subgenre so you're going to go for like You've got the metal books. You got like death metal, metalcore. <laughs> oh, that's part of it. Yeah, one of one of the books which I'm talking to a collaborator about now um, would be um, "Fight the Power," the, uh, the the Power Chords Guide to Hip Hop. Oh, right, um, okay, awesome. But uh, but yeah, I I have I have books I have books in mind for various genres, possibly even, and I've been talking to a few musical artists doing um, books, doing tie-in books in connection with bands. Uh, the books that are currently in progress are made up of pieces that were cut from power chords because otherwise power chords would have been too big to produce. It would have been M20. <laughs> yeah, um, which I couldn't give away um, you know, 60 some odd copies of those to my backers. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the books that are the books that are currently in progress, um, there is um, uh, Living the Life, which is from from you know picking up your guitar to you know to to wrapping up your career step by step chapter by chapter what you know what kinds of stories and what experiences and and so forth and characters you'll meet and stuff being a working musician um there's uh mystic rhythms which i have some <laughs> going back to my blog again i have some excerpts from that which is uh, on my blog which you will find a link to in the show notes for anyone who's listening uh, if you want to go check out uh 
Satoros's uh, musings and thoughts, uh, just click that link. Thank you. And that that book is about basically history, history and overview of magic and music. And uh, there is Born for Adventure, which is a sm- what I'm calling a power chord single, which is a small thing featuring a few story hooks and a few characters. Um, I'm putting together some venue books, which are like a club that you'll play in and Here's the layout of the club, and here are the characters that, that you'll meet in it, and so forth. Um, and there's uh, Beer Drinkers and Hellraisers, which is characters, um, and some more uh, more character options, more um, legacies and weirds. And things. I feel like you could name these these various types of book as like albums, singles, and EPs. Yeah, they're all from song titles, yeah. In fact, the, uh, the, the, the supplements all have a, uh, a section in the introduction talking about the song that the book is named for and why it's named for that song. Yeah, I always like the way World of Darkness used to do that with, with here is some supporting material. If you want to read books, listen to music, or watch films that maybe get you in the mood for this type of setting. Mm-hmm. I always found that was very, very useful. Um, so drifting slightly backwards, uh, we did promise yeah. we'd cover this. You hate the term fluff. <laughs> Let, let's let's just give you five minutes to explain what is wrong with fluff. Well, it's just the the, the term is dismissive. The term, the, the the term fluff and the way that it's used is that this is just some sort of you know dispensable little f- dispensable little frou frou that's not essential to 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 the crunch part of actually playing the game, and that's bullshit. I can see that argument, but to me, I've always said like I've never used it that way, and that I've always said I care more about fluff than mechanics. And to me, fluff mm-hmm. doesn't mean the bad things. It simply means the law, the world, the story, things that aren't mathematical about the game, and they matter yeah. to me more. Um, but to me, like that's what fluff means, but it doesn't mean it mm-hmm. in a derogatory sense. But I could see why it could be interpreted that way. Yeah, it, it's usually I, I usually see it being used uh, in a derogatory sense, and especially when and again, mage, <clears throat> but when so much of mage is about what mage means thematically not about what rules you use to cast a spell the law and the fluff yeah. are almost the same thing there is no or sorry the fluff and the mechanics there is no separation i think that's what makes mage a less intuitive game compared to a lot of things um i think that the least intuitive thing about mage is that to, in my eyes to be a good mage player it's not about what you can do with the system it's about intentionally restricting yourself through paradigm especially in earlier yes. editions where paradigm was less clearly defined as it is in oh, the most God. recent edition so the spheres, and the correct combination of the spheres, lets you achieve literally anything. So a player who likes the power game could do whatever they want. But to be a good What's mage player, point? yeah, to be a good mage player, you have to almost dial yourself back from that and go, not what can my player, what can my character do, but what can my character not do? I'm yes. playing the Verbena Witch, um, so my forces magic might be excellent at manipulating the weather, but why would it be, be able to manipulate gravity? Do I even believe in gravity as a concept? Exactly. Your spheres and, say you can do it, but why would your character have a belief system that enables them to interact with it in that way? And I think that is the hardest thing to grasp about Mage, is that it's about what your character believes, not about the dots on your sheet. Because what your character believes can't ever really be defined by dots on a sheet. Mm-hmm. And that's why in, in Mage 20, uh, I, I made focus into an intrinsic part of the uh, of, of the character the setting and the rules in previous <clears throat> for people who aren't familiar in previous editions focus was a thing that you waved around while you were casting magic it was a tool in uh, in by second edition i had begun I- I- adding magic style in there but it wasn't part of the game or rather, it was part of the game but it wasn't part of the rules uh, your whether your style was witchcraft or high wizardry or hypertech or whatever was the style that you used, but it still wasn't an intrinsic part of the rules. In Mage of the Sorcerer's Crusade, we made uh, your style was an intrinsic part of what you could and couldn't. And God, that was a good book. Is is, is M20 ever getting Sorcerer's Crusade? Uh, I know you. I know you wanted discussed. to. I want. I want to. Well, we're already past today. Th- th- this year is the twentieth anniversary, and we haven't even discussed the possibility. Uh, I, I want to do it. Um, whether or not we actually do it is going to depend a lot on the rights holders, because Path does not own the rights, and neither do I. Uh, so it's going to depend on what what on what they want. That being said, I think that some of the mechanic design changes that they're making for the new edition of vampire are very interesting i think the abolition of blood pool whilst a lot of my stalwart conservative uh world <laughs> of darkness friends who who want it to stay the same are like oh why would you get rid of blood pool is 
I think from a narrative function, the blood dice make so much sense and they're so intuitive. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes out of fifth edition. Um, I'm sure I'll like some of it and dislike some of it, as is always the way. Yeah, it's the same way with any with any edition, any different editions of anything else. Yeah. Oh, just as, as you were saying a, a little while ago, it's play the edition you want. You know, if a new edition comes out and you don't like it, then don't play it. Drive the RPG <laughs> has the old edition. Get on with it. Yeah, exactly. I I find it interesting. To me, I find it interesting talking about fluff in the context of RPGs because for me, that was a wargaming term. That I so I started wargaming before I did role playing. Mm. The idea that fluff it was superfluous. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the 40k law that is around which again is but it didn't affect it. <laughs> I enjoy yeah, there's some really bad I enjoy stuff, it, but it's, it's such so a bad. cool yeah, there's so much cool co- so many cool concepts in that world and and mm-hmm. having role playing games like rogue trader allows you to explore stuff like that and write it better um, but uh, <laughs> yeah i feel the i feel the idea of yeah the idea of country fluff i've i've never really spoken of fluff in rpgs i would always say just the story or the law um compared to the rules or the law. Yeah, law is a term I've started to use more, and I think that's because we've been playing WOD, so that's what we mm. say. But um, yeah, I mean, they're synonymous words, right? Kind of the background. Um, yeah. The, 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 term, the terms I've always preferred are setting and system. Yeah, which are probably the most accurate descriptive terms. Because the setting, the system can be applied to any setting, and a setting can be applied to almost any system. Yeah, it's, yes. So one thing that we were going to come back on, because we've only got a few points left, but each point is taking quite a while, is uh, mature settings and systems with trigger warnings and boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, I think, very important. Um, like you said, there was a game you played in that ended because somebody crossed those boundaries, but those boundaries were perhaps not clearly defined and were assumed. Now, maybe certain boundaries should be assumed and that maybe you shouldn't need to define certain boundaries, but there are differences in things, settings and systems and what is likely to occur in them. Um there is some very dark material that happens in my vampire game because it is a to an extent a horror game. Um but you always have to be careful not to cross into realms of making any players uncomfortable, and that applies very much for player on player as well as DM to player. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well the 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 aforementioned uh, the aforementioned assault, which you know, that there was nothing unintentional about that. It was an act of revenge by by her ex boyfriend. But uh, but that was player on player. An out of character act of revenge as opposed to an in character act of revenge. Yeah. The the character had no motivation to do it. It was it was an out of character act of revenge. And the G the DM allowed it. The GM allowed it, which should never have happened. And as a GM, you have a responsibility to protect and shelter some of your other players from uh, irresponsible behavior because at the end of the day you're the person in charge of that game. Yes. And I think that's very important when you have new players. Oh, mm, especially when you have new players. Because it can put them off the hobby completely. Well, that's uh, you know, uh, Sandy, my wife was was put off. Granted, it wasn't it wasn't based on a uh, it, it wasn't based on a going over discomfort level. It was just that her brother, I think it was her brother, who was running the game, um, was just running it straight by the rules and killed everybody. And she and her sister were like, "Well, fuck this. We don't want to play this." <laughs> And so they didn't until quite a while later. In fact, um, Sandy's uh, Sandy's sister, her uh, uh, her son Ian, uh, loves games and wants to be a game designer. And he wanted for his 18th birthday to run a uh, to run a D and D fifth camp uh, uh, run a D and D fifth game. That was the first time his mother, because she you know she was she was playing you know in, in the game with him. The first time his mother had played in since the early 80s. Because she was so turned off by by the uh, by the experience, Sandy wouldn't have had you know wouldn't have done it either if it hadn't been you know getting involved with my gaming group and my gaming group was a pretty good one at, at that time. Uh, and uh, though there were some personal <laughs> conflicts outside of the table uh, that they uh, they did not translate to the, the game being unpleasant. And so she was like, "Oh, this is what it's supposed to be like. This is fun." Like I said earlier, the the, the important thing is people got to be having a good time. If there's somebody being a racist dick, if there's somebody being queerphobic, if there's somebody taking out their issues with women on on female players or even just female characters, then that's not people having a good time. That's one or two people making the rest of the group pay for their issues. And I think a a large part of that is having a good time, but not at anyone else's expense. Right, exactly. I was just going to say, I I think... Another thing is one of the benefits of fantasy, the the fantastical elements and stuff, is you can get away with 
having a world as you like it as the DM. I mean, obviously with the player's consent, but in order to skip over, I'll briefly skip over like the horror stuff. Uh, I mean, Mike's game, for example, is set in our world, but plus the vampire setting. Whereas Mm -hmm. I I feel one of the benefits when you're talking, um, one of the benefits when you're running a fantasy game or something like that is you can set up the world differently. And even, even when you're setting something in the real world is just because certain stereotypes exist, you can ignore them and, and be like, well, actually, this is a better reflection of how the past should it was, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure there are some people out there who want to role-play very historically or something like that. But Well, yeah, I believe there was an old edition of a medieval World of Darkness game, a Dark Ages one, where uh, being female was a flaw, which kind of made sense in the context, but was maybe not fun for some people. Yeah. And and it was that, that uh, in that edition... Um... It's been a long time. I, I worked on that edition, but it was twenty something years ago. You can understand the designer, why that decision was made in context. But. Yeah. Well, uh, the 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 um, the the creator of the original edition of Vampire Dark Ages is a woman, uh, Jennifer Hartshorn, and she had a degree in, I believe, it was medieval literature, and she wanted to both tackle the his the historical elements while at the same time making the game fun for whoever wanted to play it, including people like her. And true to it, uh, there, there was there were some pretty <laughs> some pretty heated design arguments over the element of accuracy because Jennifer wanted it, you know, obviously with, within a certain and within certain entertaining parameters and dramatic license, but she wanted it to be historically as accurate as we could make it within those lines where there there whereas there were other people who were involved in the design team who wanted armies of vampire knights. Um, making things accurate and making things and the the whole conversation we had earlier about connecting it to reality and, and knowing the distinction between fiction and reality is Mage especially is one of those games where if you were not particularly well connected to the real world, if you didn't have much of a touchstone, you could look at the world through the lens of Mage and go, oh, it all makes sense. <laughs> like if you if you apply Mage logic to everything that's ever happened, it actually makes an eerie amount of sense as long as long as you're not able to go but it's fiction the whole transition from from magic to science etc all makes perfect sense as long as you would accept the premise that magic is is real like everything within it kind of makes sense if you look at it through its lens instead of the standard lens you look at through the world which i think is why so Mm -hmm. many like creepy people may have may have got a little too attached and started phoning members of staff asking for books of nod (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it all makes a little too much sense yeah. if you've got your tinfoil hat on uh-huh. well and that that's one of the things that's making uh working on some of the newer stuff challenging is because we're is, is because there's so much there's so much tinfoil hatting going on i mean hell even at the highest levels of government gee uh <laughs> that uh, we we're, we're feeling like we need to be okay i'm not going to speak for anybody else I feel like I need to be more careful about what I put out there uh, than I than I might have been, you know, back in nineteen ninety five. In case it causes someone to behave in a very odd manner. Yeah. Well, I mean, when 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 you've when alternative facts is literally the, when the, the the concept of alternative facts is literally coming out of the mouth of the White House sp- spokesperson. Yeah, I'm like I'm ca- I, I want to be I want to be careful to differentiate. Hi, this is not you're not supposed to do this in real life. You don't want to, you don't want to go full taxi driver on it. Be like, oh yeah, no, uh, right. This guy changed the world by killing the president. Wink, wink. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are definitely. I mean, uh, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> to, to segue into a very different point, I think I think Tom had some questions regarding this next one, didn't you, Tom? But I, I think you've already touched on this a little bit. Um, talking about trying to get the rights to because you don't own the rights to some of these mm. uh, settings. Um. What kind of IP problems and kind of plagiarism have you had to deal with? Well, if that's a thing you want to discuss, I appreciate Well, no, it's, 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 a legit, it's a legitimate topic, especially because so many people think we got rich and we didn't. <laughs> and, and movies uh, like Wanted exist. Oh, you, you, and you know how I feel about that movie. I love uh, that movie. I think it's a great movie. I also think it is the Loom of Fate, which was a Euthanatos type adventure path for Mage. The Luma Fate is literally directly taken from that, word for word. <laughs> yeah, that was. I was amused when we went to see the movie. I think the movie's terrible, but I, I was amused when we went to see the movie. I'm like, ah, they're doing the Thanatos, the motion picture. And then I read the uh, I read the graphic novel, and I got angry because the graphic novel had the only premise is the character names and the fact that a assassin son dies. Assassin son inherits his position in a supervillain club. That's it. 
That's yeah. the only thing that's gone, gone. Hold on. And there, and there, there is one scene that is played out almost word for word in the uh, the, the the training scene it is almost is. But no, all the rest of it it bears more resemblance to Mage than it does to uh, to its original. And source it's, it's horrendously obvious. And and what got me angry about that is this is something that I and some other people did work for hire twenty something years ago. Our names aren't on it. We didn't get any money from it. And and meanwhile, um, um, Mark Millar gets credit. He got money and all this stuff. And they didn't adapt his story. They adapted ours. That that I get angry about. It's not not even the fact that someone was inspired by your material. It's the fact that they didn't credit you, even even in a non monetary way. And that someone else got credited for something they had nothing to do with. Yeah, I mean the underworld thing. People people go, oh well, vampires and werewolves existed before underworld. Yes, but they used they used illustrations as frame for frame models. They took copyrighted terms like abomination. Uh, they took they they took concepts that were straight out of an original and unique. Elders too. being resurrected by younger blood was yeah, straight and- from World of Darkness. Straight from World of Darkness, Blade too, but uh, but the the fact that they there were pictures of vampire books on set in the production era in the in the production offices that was I think the final reason that that that, that they settled was because we had proof you can't claim to have not lifted this material when the material is on set is on the set exactly and it's I, I've I've made the remark before and and. Uh, uh, Michael, you may have seen me say this. I said that we're role playing games is the group of people that is the profession that the comic book people look down on. Yeah, and comic book people until recently struggled to be taken seriously. And now that now that, that there's money being raked in by certain studios. Hmm. Well, and even then, many of the comic book creators, I mean, Malar and uh, Malar and Moore and Gaiman have been extraordinarily lucky. I mean, Jack Kirby's <laughs> Jack Kirby's family is they they finally fought for years in court and 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 you know were shamed in that they weren't shamed but Marvel was shamed into paying them residuals. But I, I met years ago. I met War, Marv Wolfman at uh, at a convention. We were we were both guesting it, and I I was effusively thanking him for what I had learned about storytelling graphic storytelling from uh, tomb of dracula back in the 70s and this was right shortly after blade came out and shortly after he had attempted to get royalties for blade and lost even though he's the guy who created the damn character but he created them work for hire uh, for folks who aren't familiar with the term work for hire means you, you you as a creative person are doing a creative work for somebody who owns all the rights to it they pay you money they get they own the rights and they get the royalties and so forth. Uh, in the 1980s, the situation, mostly by way of, of Jack Kirby getting screwed, uh, the situation came up for arbitration in the comic book industry because a number of people, including Alan Moore, uh, Neil Gaiman, um, Frank Miller, uh, basically said, we're not going to do this if you're going to screw us. Yeah, oh, Neil Gaiman's a powerful voice. Neil Gaiman is a huge voice. Yeah, and uh, they're, they're like, you're going to at least pay us royalties. Okay, we understand why we can't own the rights to Captain America if we write a Captain America story. Captain America belongs to you. However, if this story arc that I write makes a whole lot of money, I get royalties. And we started to do the same thing because role-playing games were a similar situation. In fact, uh, I mentioned uh, Gygax and Arneson earlier. Gygax and Arneson wound up you know, for years fighting each other in court because Gygax, Gygax came up with the rules, Arneson came up with the setting, they both created D&D equally, um, but Gygax was the one who got the credit and the money, and Arneson ended up getting edged out, yeah, and uh, first Arneson was edged out, and eventually Gygax was edged out, <laughs> and the, the rights and the, and the money went to people who had, had nothing to do with it at all. Was it Hasbro? Then? Well, Hasbro, yeah, Hasbro eventually ended up buying them, uh, because of, of business, a combination of bad business decisions and uh, and bad luck in the marketplace, um, wound up um, putting TSR on the auction block. And, and Hasbro, who who had nothing to do with any of it, owns the rights now. And similar situation to, to the World of Darkness. You know, a company that didn't exist when we were building the World of Darkness owns the rights now. Yeah, but the the situation in terms of uh, in terms of the creators, the situation in, in gaming is still pretty bad. Unless you are actually founding, as as I did with uh, um, with with um, 
uh, Quiet Thunder Productions and Laughing Can Productions, unless you are actually forming your own company. And even in the case of Laughing Can, I, I the, the rights wound up in limbo when uh, my former business partners and I split up. Uh, by contract, all of us own the rights, um, but one of us is refusing to let the others use them, so they're in limbo. You know, Deliria has been in limbo for over ten years. Um, with uh, with power cords, which I am never ever selling the rights to anybody for any amount of money. That one, that one belongs to me, and it will always belong. Uh, and uh, the world of darkness, it never did. I, 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 we came in and we worked with White Wolf with the understanding that White Wolf owns it. So I can I can periodically complain about a lack of royalties, but and you can detach yourself from it to an extent because you had an agreement up front. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I can't. I, I would never say they screwed me because I agreed to it. I kind of said sometimes wish the terms had been a little different. But then again, when uh, like I said earlier, we had no idea it was going to be like this. We had no idea twenty twenty five year twenty twenty five years later there would still be you know World of Darkness books and World of Darkness players. I mean, didn't someone recently do a World of Darkness documentary? Yeah, you you laugh. Uh, was it was it was it not not? <laughs> The oh, I, I have no idea. I, uh, I haven't. I haven't seen it. No, the reason I laugh is because I, I, I don't know almost anybody who was actually talked to about that. Right. <laughs> so somebody, somebody's made fact. it, but nobody appears to have been consulted or asked questions or yeah. Put in. They, they talked to Mark and Stephen Stu. I'm not aware of anybody else involved that they talked to. Then again, I haven't seen it, so I might be wrong there. They didn't talk to me. <laughs> So we, we touched on this briefly earlier, but um, games have been used as therapy now, haven't they? I mean, there's a BBC mm-hmm. article here, um, particularly with... I would love to see that article. You're linking that one, right? So it's just there, and it will go in the show notes. But it's particularly being used with autistic children, as you mentioned with um, Coyote, rest, rest Coyote. Soul, mm-hmm. um, as a way to help them socialize and to put themselves into social situations they may not have experienced or know how to experience and act them out in a safe environment. Yeah, there's, I don't know if, because I haven't seen the BBC article, I don't know if it's talking about um, oh, uh, Hawk Robinson, I think. It was. It's actually talking about, it's based in Seattle and Kirkland. Yeah, okay, that, that is Hawk's group, yeah. Uh, Hawk, I think his last name is Robinson, I'm forgetting. Well, he's been referenced, and his, his therapy's been referenced in the BBC, so if he's not aware of that, then... Oh, good. So it apparently is... They've they referenced the name of Jack Birkenstock and the Bodhana Group. Uh, that is apparently therapeutic D and D games providing mental health treatment for juvenile male sex offenders. I'm glad I'm not DMing yeah, it. And, <laughs> but apparently, it's the bleed of how much the personal identity impacts the character they're playing and how much the character impacts them in return. Yeah. So I think mm-hmm. it's taking themselves out of their their own context and putting them into different contexts. Good. Yeah it it has it has uh, it has tremendous possibilities for that sort of thing. Uh, as as Hawk himself, we Hawk we were just talking with Hawk uh, about two weeks ago at ZoeCon. Uh, as Hawk has cautioned, it's using D and D or using role playing as therapy without a therapy background could be kind of a problem. Well, any therapy without a therapy background and, is a problem because you don't exactly know, you don't know what you do. It, it's like kind of you know trying to um, change your boiler without a background in plumbing. You might just blow your house up. Be careful. Right. Um, there, there were people who were doing it, uh, doing it not in a deliberately therapeutic sense, but in uh, in a, a sense of just helping out their friends. Uh, our friend Anthony Galatis in uh, in Greece has been doing that very successfully for years. He's not a therapist. He's not using it deliberately as therapy, but he's using it as a catharsis. And literally, since they're Greek, uh, but he's using it as a catharsis for for the problems that he and his friends uh, are facing in you know in in a, a nation that that has been uh, trying not to collapse for the last six years, uh, eight years, and there's an increasing amount of that in the states. I think I think that I suspect there'll be even more. You know, it's it's even beyond fun and storytelling. It has perhaps practical applications, and those are now just being beginning to be explored for the first time. And that is really mm-hmm. interesting to look at from an academic point of view as well as a hobbyist point of view. Yeah, especially with the especially with relation to autism uh, and uh, social anxieties and sensory processing uh, conditions. Uh, I, I can look back at it myself now in retrospect and realize that one of the reasons I've 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 occasionally said that. Uh, my my life was saved by theater, um, heavy metal, and role playing games, and I 
I can look back at my my 13 year old self and realize one of the reasons why I was able to do that um, was because gaming, even even the primitive gaming that we had in the, the, the late 70s and early 80s, uh, gaming and theater and heavy metal gave me tools to construct an identity that I was happy with. And, and then with I power chords, with. you get to mix them all together and. and- Yes, <laughs> exactly people. that. But it's, it, it, gave, it gave me a social context at a time when I did not socialize very well or very easily. And it does that for a lot of other people too. I think kind of on that point and following up on what we said about communities previously, our final point is we, we would like to talk about the student nationals, which is a thing we have in the UK. A bit of a plug, I suppose. I, um, I, yeah, hype. We're, we're, we're very on hype the hype train. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm... Um, <laughs> This is a kind of brilliant event where you're getting. This is a. a it's a student wargaming and nas- uh, and uh, role playing national championship. And cool. Well, how how does how does competitive role play sound to you, uh, Sata? It sounds like a, a a misnomer, doesn't it? it? Sounds like it can't really exist. Uh, it works. It works just fine in terms of strategic role playing. I mean, they had. You know, they've tournaments for D and D since you know since the mid seventies. I don't think it works quite like that either. So, Tom, why, why do you why do you run us through how how we engage with the Nats? Firstly, just to say we're no longer students, and one of the cool things about nationals is that people like us have been invited back to DM and run stuff, and also we get to come back as like an old kids team where nice. yeah, we're the vague veteran. Our points don't really matter, but it, it's fun to kind of come along and like and be be a group of. Uh, you know, have that continuing link with people and, and enjoy role playing and, and board gaming. So yeah, Tom, Nats and categories and playing. How how are we scored? How do we attend? What groups are we put in? Yeah, so I think you might have to correct me on some of the RPG stuff. So this is the first year I'm actually gonna play in the RPG um section. I've always played board games prior to this. So I did competitive board games and this year last year I did um team board games. Oh, I might but, have to talk about scoring then. <laughs> Yeah, you might have to talk about the exact specifics of scoring, but maybe I can give an overview. The overview being that um, you go and play in your chosen category, whether that's D&D or WOD or Fate or uh, Systemless. Um, the way it works is, you, I mean, you play a game for two days and your the scoring is mostly done by the DMs, I believe. They get together and they talk about the games they've played and they talk about the players and it's all about that kind of... It, it's, it's, it's competitive in that there are points, but it's not competitive in that you're trying to be the best at the dungeon. It's about how you play the game and you earn points for your interactions with other characters. I'm going this year to Urban Fantasy. There will be three Urban Fantasy games over two days. I will be in two. Nice. Uh, one person from each team can be in a game. So you could have multiple people in a category, but not in a game. Um, games are usually about five players. And the, the, I, I can't stress this enough. The GMs are volunteers. They come up for the weekend to have a great time with everyone else. They're not paid for this, and if they were, it would be unaffordable because there are hmm. about a thousand people turn up every year. I'd say it's enormous, a lot of money for the university, it's huge, yeah. especially in drinking. A lot of booze money goes over that. <laughs> but you turn up. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. I will attend a game on Saturday and a game on Sunday with a different GM in the same group. So between the three GMs, each of them will have had two of the groups, and they will discuss how the games went. And so I'll play in a game on Saturday and a game on Sunday that are completely unconnected with different GMs. Uh, usually with pre-generated characters, which you'll pick randomly, um, and a scenario that you'll play through, and they'll they'll score you based on things like how entertaining were you, how easy to play with were you, how much did you bring out the best in the players around you, um, and things like that, you know, and th- how do, how how much do you say in character thing, you know, all these things that that would be seen as positive, and they will decide between them a first, second, and third place player. Uh, based on things that happened and and player behaviors um and then there will be points allocated and they total up all the points at a big ceremony at the end where there are also winners for things like best sportsman in um competitive wargaming as well so not only is there you know wargaming points there's painting competition there's best sportsman then you've got Mm. competitive board gaming social board gaming a myriad of role play categories um a fancy dress competition usually where there are points awarded mm. and the the winning team gets the option the choice of whether they will host the next nationals or pass the choice down to the team in the next place and it's a great event every year and all people have to pay is generally about 25 quid towards the cost of running it and it's mostly run by volunteers and their own hotels or wherever they're staying and we go away for the weekend somewhere in the country and meet hundreds maybe even thousand different role play gamers and board gamers and just have a great time and you know Big bad, rest in peace. But uh, you know, thank you for helping set all that up. It's an amazing event, and if you're ever 
in the UK around um, April time, um, Sata. Just just let us know, and we'll we'll try and tell you when and where it's going on. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a lot of fun, and a lot of money's raised for charity as well. So one of the things they'll do is they'll pick a charity. The host will pick a charity, and uh, you'll go in, and there will be custom dice. Is a thing that Vague started when they hosted it. Um, so there's always dice to commemorate the event that you'll get. But you'll there's a charity re-roll pot. So if you want to re-roll something, put some money in the pot. <laughs> and every year it raises right. thousands of pounds for a charity as people reach into their pockets. And, and usually you get one of these complimentary um, dice uh, at the end, you know, every time you donate the money. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you donate enough to get the whole set as a minimum usually. Mm-hmm. So yeah, thousands of pounds raised for charity every year. Fantastic event that does good as well as has great fun. Yes, it's absolutely phenomenal. Great fun. Uh, I think, yeah, we, we've been talking at length. I think that wraps up a lot of our topics. Uh, we're going to roll for Tom. Have you got the the hat? What hat are you pulling pulling the subject out of today, Tom? I have a multicoloured hat I bought in Thailand that I had to uh, barter for, and I felt really awkward about bartering for it, but it's multicoloured and amazing. <laughs> there will be a picture of that on... on uh, there will definitely right? be a picture for that. It's always Tom's hat, so I have like three hats. Tom, Tom has a mirror. I mean, I have sent, I have sent you one, but you sent me two, so like we're never <laughs> going to quite equal out. <laughs> Whilst he's searching, Asata, what's your favourite hat? I'm sure you strike me as a man that has hats. I don't actually like hats. You don't? I like don't hats own at any. All. Oh, you don't own any? I don't like hats. No, the closest thing to a hat, I, I, I own a bunch of hoodies because I live in Seattle. What, what of the hat of many things? That's a fine hat. <laughs> <laughs> And our category is back to one of our most popular categories. Is it politics? No, no, no. Board oh. games. Board games. Board games. Excellent. And we have four subcategories of board games. So, what, What's your favorite board game, Sator? Oh, uh, that would be Touch of Evil from Flying Frog. I love that. Uh, Sandy loves that. I was going to say Flying Frog. They make games like, uh, is it Fame of Last Night on Earth? And Glory. Yeah, Fame, and Last Night. yeah, yeah. Fortune and Glory, Fa- Last Night on Earth. Or the um, Touch of Darkness. Yeah, t- Touch of Darkness. It's It's essentially... Though this isn't what they call it, this is what we call it. But it's a, it's it's a sleepy hollow the role playing game. Ooh. It's just, it's essentially it's a a New England a small New England town in the late 1700s is having problems with a monster. The characters are strangers coming into the town to fight the monster, and depending on what expansions you have, you have a few dozen different monsters to choose from, and a few dozen different characters to choose from, and. Um, your essentially your your goal as a group is to stop the monster before the monster destroys the town. I, I have a German friend who doesn't like board games very much, and his response is, "Why would I ever play a board game when I can play a role playing game?" <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing about uh, uh, Flying Frogs games is you can play them as role playing games because <laughs> you know your your movie you have it whether it's you know whether it's Fortune and Glory or uh, or or, or um, Last Night on Earth or whatever it's they're we always talk in character and, you know, and we, we, we describe it like the movie and okay, the character's going up the stairs now and, you know, the, the, the theme music is building and what's at the top of the stairs. What are our four sub- subcategories then, Tom? Uh, well, what, which one are we going to pull out that? We don't need to list them. Kingdom Death. Oh, oh. Kingdom Death, the fantastic game of crunchy dungeon crawling and harvesting monsters for parts with a sad amount of, of uh, how do I even describe, exaggerative features perhaps on its oh, network. Oh, that's, okay, that's the thing. Once again, with Zombie Orpheus Convention, there, there were a few of the folks there who were assembling Kingdom, Kingdom Death miniatures while they were really good game food. really high quality min- miniatures, yeah, the miniatures some rather amazing. unrealistic proportions on some of the people well first off uh, is there anything you haven't plugged that you would like to plug Sater? well i am a big fan as i mentioned earlier of uh, of avery adler's work with, uh, with with buried without ceremony and with the uh, the work on bluebeard's bride uh, by uh, whitney strix Beltran, and i'm blanking on her other collaborators off the top of my head simply because i'm tired and <laughs> uh but uh but i i'm i'm extremely impressed with uh with, with monster hearts and with uh with bluebeard's bride um and with uh with with blue uh, with uh blue rose second edition uh by by my friends and, and green ronin and i want to say a, a shout out to richard thomas for uh for onyx path publishing because things would be very very different uh for, for us world of darkness people 
uh, if he hadn't picked up the ball and run with it. Was he involved in the original White Wolf team, or did he just sort of pick up? Oh, yeah, we can do more with it. Uh, he he's he's as old school as White Wolf gets. I mean, he he was involved with White Wolf magazine before White Wolf games even existed. And he just said, "There's more we can do with this. It's not dead yet. Let's do more." Yeah, that was exactly it. Rich was uh, uh, Rich was one of the original illustrators and the original art director for for White Wolf, uh, and that's you know we, we worked together through the '90s. And he became the creative director when. Um, um, when CCP took over, and when CCP closed down the uh, the game division, they laid everybody off, including Rich. At which point, Rich was like, "So we're in the middle of this whole werewolf, this whole werewolf twenty thing. Do you mind if if I t- form a company and finish it under license?" And they're like, "Yeah, sure, whatever." That's how Onyx Path started, and that's why there is still a world of darkness. Is that it is because rich um uh, rich took up took the ball and ran with it and said you know, something he said to me back when we were uh when we were first discussing mage 20 he said i want i want to bring the magic back he said i really miss what it was like you know to have this office full of you know this office full of crazy people creating this magical stuff he said he and he says you know i i, I really feel like that got lost and i want to bring it back and he has and the products that came out of it have been as a consumer as someone who bought a lot of those products fantastic uh yeah i've really enjoyed them so yeah thanks to thanks to to rich and you and the rest of the teams that helped that i'm I'm looking forward to my new edition of scion uh yeah i've got multiple m20 v20 w20 books um and it's it's the best edition yet i'm excited to see what they do with fifth edition but there's a bar that's been set now Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah Yeah, they're they're, yeah (laughs) it's it's going to be interesting to see so your patreon what uh what's the link to your patreon uh the link to the it's uh phil brucato uh at patreon uh might actually let me double check that it might be sodoros phil brucato at uh, patreon uh but my patreon has basically anything that is not connected with mage i i can't the public the publishers don't want me putting mage stuff up there and i totally understand that one uh but i put up excerpts from novels that i'm that i'm working on uh short story fiction uh advanced tracks, rough tracks, and so forth from Telesterion, uh, my band. I also want to mention them. Uh, but uh, but folks folks who, uh, who back my Patreon will find a backlog of dozens and dozens and dozens of, of neat things. And uh, I'm, I put up new posts there between four and eight times a month. It's depending on what my, uh, what my freelance schedule looks like at that point. Uh, what I put up, I just... The other day, put up some noodling that I was doing on my base, laying the uh, the groundwork for some new tracks for Telesterion, uh, and for uh, uh, for the, for um, Valentine's Day, I put up a, uh, a novella that I had published under my pen name Cedar Blake. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff on there, <laughs> and I'm always putting more stuff up all the time. Uh, and there's my band, the occult bo- uh, occult rock band uh, Telesterion, which uh, I joined slash co-formed a few years ago with some friends of mine who were uh uh, they've been doing rock operas based on the rituals of alistair crowley for uh about 15 years now and uh, we originally started by just jamming on some of the songs that they had done from those rituals and then we started uh, we realized we had chemistry started writing original stuff and uh, we've we've played out played a bit a bit over a dozen times we have our first album is on Bandcamp. Our second album is currently uh, in being uh, being mastered and packaged, uh, and uh, so we'll have some new material out soon. The perfect accompaniment accompaniment to your game of power chords. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep, and and power chords. Check out power chords. It has not only uh, you know, not only been my passion project, but uh, but Sandy, uh, my wife, has done most of the photography in it, and just some really really beautiful artwork in there. And I don't just say that because you know Sandy's my wife; I say it because the book is bloody gorgeous. So yeah, that you know we've had a great time on this show, this recording. Uh, it's been longer than we anticipated. You've taken the time to join us all the way from the other side of the ocean um it's been really good to have you on to talk to you um and to learn more about the industry and your views on on gaming and the history of it hopefully this is a good episode for people who weren't familiar with it or even people who were um i very much enjoyed myself Uh, i can't speak for tom he's he's miserable he hates everything don't worry about it (laughs) uh no i mean i'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us it's been been enlightening interesting and 
I mean, it's just cool to be able to talk to people like yourself about the kind of stuff you do day to day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I've, I've been having a blast talking with y'all. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And we managed to keep it I, fairly I really clean. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I have to throw in a few C words there just to, just, just to justify the extreme. <laughs> You can support us as well at Patreon. So we have a Patreon. <laughs> what? <laughs> we do. Um, uh, one. Th- this is new. Uh, it was originally. Shout out for... to Will, our single backer. Woo woo. Was on our board gaming episode. Check that out. So yeah, we, yeah, we have a, a Patreon, and it's at Patreon forward slash TTSS. There you can sign up uh, as a general backer or specifically for individual podcasts that that I I, I produce. That includes this one. And the idea is hopefully to at least fund the cost of running the website. Uh, if, um, if you like booze, the website also has Tom's other podcast, uh, Dr. Wilco's Guide to Better Beverages, in which he uh, tries and makes and samples new cocktails. Yep. Uh, and I also post reviews there uh, when I get the opportunity to do a review that's not for my kind of freelance gig. So that's, you know, occasionally I get to go to restaurants on my own money as opposed to getting them for free. <laughs> Um, so yes, I'll, I'll find that on there. And there's also there's now a politics podcast I've started called Commons People that will also be. So if you if you want to know what's going on in the realms of old blighty uh, yeah. land, lands of fish and chips and bad teeth, just check out Commons People, <laughs> like the BBC, but only more biased. <laughs> We're so left leaning, it hurts. On the note of being veterans, Tom, you know how vague is the biggest team and has this attend as two teams because we're so big that we would automatically win if we were attended as one team yeah well we keep expanding and it's been suggested that we might eventually have to split into three teams and like well if we have vague the uni team and vague the veterans what's the third team going to be called it's like well you have to move all the vets into the third team and then have a new team of vets and then have a new team of uni students obviously the oldest players are going to have to be vague memories <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we'll end up with like vague grey beards and things like that. <laughs> People with their book of grudges from previous sessions. I like that year when Liam turned up and absolutely smashed Sheffield at Wargaming when they won every single year. And I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> he played a team of orcs in Warhammer 40k, uh, Sator, where uh, it was described when he won first place with 98 out of 100 possible points as a, an army with all the subtlety yet effectiveness of a brick thrown at the table. <laughs> <laughs>